Welcome to the Spurs 9501 podcast. From Kane to the lane, the final say on all things Tottenham. Welcome back to the Spurs 9501 podcast. I've got Harshal Patel again with us. Welcome back, Harshal. Thank you, Thank for, you for having me again, Ray. It's, it's great to be back. No, no, we got some really good feedback from Harshal's first video. Excellent video on tactics and XG, etc. So we really wanted to get Harshal back to talk about what Nuno's potentially going to do in the future, what formations he might play, what his record has been, etc., etc. So, Harshal, I think you, you wanted to clarify some things about XG and XGA, etc. So please go ahead. Yeah, so... As you mentioned, we we sort of int- I introduced what expected goals is in the last uh, podcast that we did, and it's also I think important to point out how it should be used, or rather, what you should be looking for when you look at those numbers, yep. because it's all well and good knowing what XG is, but there's um, you also need to understand when it's useful and when it's not. So, like for example, personally, and I think this is a view that's shared by many in the in the football analytics community that. The way a lot of the broadcasters use XG, which is, for example, say a Sky Sports or a BBT, uh, BBC or ITV or whoever, they nowadays are at the end of a game, when you have all your statistics from a game, they'll also pop in the XG there. So yep. say it was Spurs versus Chelsea. Spurs had uh, an XG of 2.5. Chelsea had an XG of 1.5, where the final score was one all, for example. And what, the, what people think that means is that, oh, okay, Spurs created more chances or rather they or that they created better quality chances they should have scored more goals but uh, they only scored one goal whereas chelsea scored one goal when they only had say uh, when they had a lesser yep. um, xg value from the match and that that does hold true but it's um it's not as clear cut as as uh, it looks because the way to look at xg from a single game and i i mentioned this earlier uh, in the last episode is that ideally you, you want to look at xg over a period of time because it's best used used as a predictive tool because it can tell you how well a team is doing in terms of creating chances. XGA is obviously expected goals against, so it'll tell you how good a team is at preventing chances uh, be, uh, from being created against them. And uh, whether the, when the goal numbers don't really match that, you can may and obviously with a little bit more analysis, you can maybe make a case that, you know what, so-and-so team are not doing so well at the moment, but their XG numbers are really good. You know, they're creating chances, but they're not scoring the goals. So they, you can expect them to maybe come back to the mean in that sense, the reversion to the mean where you you can expect them to maybe start scoring goals again sooner, for example. that's yep. And that's yep. uh, one thing we saw with Brighton last year, who were, I mean, the, the darlings of the analytics world in that sense, because they were doing fantastically on all types of metrics, XG, XGA, PPDA, all of those metrics, but they were down at the bottom of the table. So, the, the conclusion that people drew from there was that, you know what, they should be higher up the table, but they're not, which is true. But that was also down to the fact that their strikers were not finishing. You know, they were creating the chances, but the strikers weren't finishing um, the chances that were being created. So there is a case to be made that if Brighton can recruit a good centre forward this summer and they can keep most of the work that they did last season going into the new season, that they should do much better this year. So that's just an overall... Um, over, uh, sort of like an overview of what I was talking about, but when sure. looking at s- single matches, yep. what you need to look at is say, okay, going back to the example I used earlier, where Spurs say have an XG of two point five from one match, and from the same game, their opponents Chelsea have had an XG of one point five. But it could very well be that Spurs, you know, only had say, or not only say Spurs had twenty shots in the game, Chelsea had only ten shots. Again, if you only look at the shots, you'll think, well, that that uh, you know that that supports what I was thinking earlier. Spurs were more attacking; they had more shots; they had higher xG. But you then need to look at the individual shots as well, because uh, if you remember, going back to my discussion on what xG is, an xG value is assigned for every shot that is taken, right? Yep, so, yep. and obviously, the higher the higher the xG value, the the greater the likelihood of scoring. So it could very well be that Spurs had 20 shots, but most of them were long distance shots or shots from positions that were not great or there were defenders in the way. So the individual XG values were low, 
But because they had 20 shots, when you add them all up, it adds up to a decent number, say 2.5, for example. Chelsea, on the other hand, 10 shots, 1.5 XG. But they've had those shots from really good positions. Yeah, so, so the individual mean, yeah. XG value of those shots is higher. Yeah. So then that, that they've, they've actually created the better chances. Even though Spurs may have had more shots and their total XG is higher. When you look at it in that way, Chelsea could actually have been the team that created the better chances. Yeah. The no, that actually makes sense. Chances. That makes sense, actually. So and, the total XG yeah. value is not really a good indicator of how good the chances were. Yeah. Exactly. So it's ideal when you're looking at just one match that you try and find out what the individual um, XG values for the shots were, how many shots were taken, because that will give you a much better idea of how good a team was. And it's also important to remove penalties from the equation. Okay. So a, penal- a, p- a penalty has the highest XG of any chance. Uh, most stats providers will give you um, an XG value of 0.74 to or between 0.74 and 0.76. So effectively, 75% of 0.75 will be the value of a penalty, which is, again, going, it's it's historical trends that three out of four penalties are scored, basically. Historical, that's yep. the XG value that you will get for a penalty. And as you can see, that's that's a massive um, amount, right? Like So again, when you're looking at, a, at the XG totals from a single game, it's best to remove penalties if there have been any awarded in the match, because that will give you a true picture of what chances were created because the penalty can can give you you know can inflate your xg total extremely uh, by by a, a pretty big margin when you know you may not really have created too much but just because you got a penalty you scored that penalty or missed it but your xg value has been inflated because you got the penalty so these are two things which i think it's um, important to remember when you're looking at expected goal um, numbers from individual matches as I said earlier, you can all. This is uh, not to say that you can't use them when you're looking at single uh, individual matches. It's just that you just need to drill down a little more into the data, try and find out indi- what the individual values are, and that will give you a much better picture of how um, how the game was in terms of creativity and which team was uh, creating better chances. Okay, Arshul, that's very good. So, just in summary, then don't look at the total XG value. Look at the individual XG values. And secondly, remove any penalties because they've got a 0.75 rating. They may skew the overall uh, XG value, uh, the total value. Is that correct? So that's a good point. As far as, unfortunately, Absolutely. Sky Sports yes. and these other guys don't do that. So <laughs> we'll have to try and do it ourselves or maybe work with you on that one. So <laughs> that's really good. Um, yeah. So I believe you wanted to talk about Nuno, um, potential tactics and the way he's played previously and how you think it may work in the future with Spurs. Is, uh, can you give us some more information on that, Harshal? Yes. So, um, obviously, we all know Nuno's work in England with Wolves. He's spent a good amount of time there. He, he won season in the championship as well, where they absolutely um, took that division by storm, uh, won the title, came up. To the Premier League, they've been a very good, solid Premier League side uh, in in the three seasons that he's been in the Premier League as well. But that has also sort of created the impression that he is a defensive manager or someone who looks to you know try and close out games and and not really attack a lot. And what I'll say to that is that Nuno is actually the definition of a pragmatic manager. Now people use the term pragmatic for most famously for for Mourinho for Jose Mourinho. Yep. But the truth is that Mourinho is as is as stubborn and as dogmatic in that sense as a Pep Guardiola or a Jurgen Klopp. Because while, say, Klopp, Guardiola, Eric Ten Hag, these guys are all, um, you know, more about having the ball, trying to attack. And that is their sort of Bible or that's the way they want to play no matter who the opposition is. Mourinho, on the other hand, was, or rather is someone who will... More than not look to seed the the initiative. He, he'll want to give the ball away. Not really a fan of having the ball. He's fine staying back, having his team defend and then counter counterattacking. That is um, sort of his the the way he operates. But it's it's quite rigid as well, right? So he's I would not say people in the media or just generally the the people often use the word pragmatic for Mourinho, and that's not the case. Pragmatic basically means that he's uh, someone who is willing to adapt to circumstances circumstances and is willing to change based on the environment and what the situation is and that's actually some Nuno is um, 
someone who is a lot like that because he's played with the back three yes for the most uh, for the majority of time at wolves but that is because of the nature of the squad that he had at wolves where it was very well suited to playing with the back three he did try and move to a back four last season it didn't work out too well but I, my argument is that that's a down to the, the fact that he attempted this switch in the middle of a season you you need a lot of time in pre-season to drill a new system into players especially when you've not played that system at all right you've yep. been playing a back three for years and he suddenly moves to a back four the, even the players will need time to adapt to it which they didn't have because he made this change midway through the season especially during last season which was anyway extremely compact extremely tight because of the covid-19 pandemic yep. you know yep. matches were being held with lesser and lesser time between them for teams to recover and work on training and all of that so and also i will also i will also argue that maybe wolves probably didn't have the players to play with the back four that well so when you look at all of that i think nuno it's not a given that he will play with the back three but having said all, all of the stuff that i said earlier i personally do think that he will play with the back three because when i look at the spurs squad it does seem very well suited to playing with the back three and wing backs now i'm just going to share my screen here yeah. and um Put out a couple of potential lineups that you could see yeah. while with, you're doing uh, that there's a lot of there's yes, a lot sorry, of, there's a lot of talk that uh, you know Nuno is Mourinho 2.0 and he's very are, is there a lot of similarities between um, Mourinho and Nuno is Nuno a disciple of Mourinho or do they have the same thought I know you spoke about that but is that actually true in the stats and the way they play I mean they they do have they do have a connection i mean nuno's played under mourinho yeah, yeah. nuno was at a goalkeeper Porto, yeah. for mourinho uh, back back yeah back when he was at when mourinho was porto manager so they do have a connection in that sense but from what i have read about nuno he's uh quite different to mourinho in the sense that he really likes to build a family sort of environment at the club right. he's from, from all accounts that whatever we've heard about the the working environment at wolves with the coaches and the players it's very tight knit they're very um he he's someone who is empathetic in that sense he sure, will sure uh take he will he will try and understand players he'll try and make them feel valued he'll try and uh build them up in that sense which i mean as a man united fan talking about spurs when we talk about mourinho yeah. that's not something no he's not famous for that is that it? comes to yeah. mind right mourinho Mur- Yeah I mean no Mourinho does have like there are players who you can talk to today and they will still tell you that they've run through a wall for Mourinho but I think there's a very specific type of player who connects with Mourinho because Mourinho is still more of an old school manager yeah in terms of his mentality so at Spurs I think Harry Kane has been one of the most um outspoken or rather he's been the one player who's been very happy under Mourinho or someone who was willing to do what Mourinho asked him to do but uh i mean we've seen with luke shaw the resurgence that he's had at man united after mourinho left paul pogba has also done much better at united after mourinho left but so i think the modern footballer needs a little bit more um you know you need to have a shoulder around the arm you need to try and understand them encourage them rather than sort of berating them yep, or, yep. or you know calling them out in public mm-hmm. criticizing them in public mm. that sort of thing doesn't really work with modern footballers or just the mod, uh, say my generation or maybe even a generation younger than mine. Yeah, sure. So in that sense I think Nuno will bring a lot of difference. I think the environment around the club will be a lot better than what it was uh, under Mourinho. From what I've heard uh, he's not been able he's not been allowed to bring his entire backroom staff. I think he's bringing three or four people along sure, from uh, sure. the guys who were with him at Wolves in terms of his coaching staff. Yeah. So it it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that works out in terms of his dynamic with the guys with some of the coaches who are already there at Spurs but yeah. he does like to build a, uh, an inclusive and a and a i'd say a positive environment in that sense so just from that point of view i think he's quite different from mourinho and and spurs should hopefully see the benefit of that this season okay excellent thanks for that so did you want to share your screen so our viewers can see you know your 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 yes. your the presentation that you're going to give okay great yeah yeah just doing that Yeah so I hope that's visible. Yep. Um now Oh that's better. Yeah, yeah I yeah. think that's better. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So when you look at this sort of lineup 
it's a back it's a 343 three. this i think this is something that spurs fans should get used to seeing next season okay. and i've put the probable i've put the probable starters in there who i expect um to be the starting 11 okay assuming that uh, spurs do get the deal for takahiro Tomi- tomiyasu done yep. um obviously a bid has been put in uh, with bologna and from what i've read there's not too much difference in terms of what bologna are asking for and what spurs have offered at the moment so i expect that deal to get made now okay. he's a japanese he's a japanese international defender who is comfortable playing as at at right back or in a back 3 as the right side at center back so i expect him to slot into that uh spot in the spurs 11 yep and the the rest of the lineup as you can see if obviously toby oliver where else stays he'll be at the center mm. ben davies or maybe even joe rodon as the left side at center back you've got um sergio reguilon and matt dohotty as the wing backs yep pml hoybier uh and potentially tango and dombley in the midfield pivot and then you've got your front three of uh son lucas kane now i'm just going to show another alternative lineup here where say uh if you had a 3-4 or a 3-5-2 it doesn't have to be a 3-4-3 he can who knows also play the 3-5-2 yep and then again you can see i provided alternatives to the players who were starting so eric dyer can easily slot in for all the varel joe rodon can come in for uh, Ben Davies, Jaffet Tanganga is also, I think, quite comfortable playing as the right-sided centre back, so he can come in there. Um, midfield again, Oliver Skip has come back from a very, very good loan yeah. at Norwich City. So, if he sticks around, if he doesn't go for another loan, I think he will be competing with uh, Indombele in the midfield. Um, you've got Ryan Sessegnon coming back from loan as well. He, I think, is very well suited to playing as a wing back rather yeah. than as a full back. So that's another position where I think. he can slot in act as backup for Reguilon uh and if if Spurs do go with the 352 you you will have obviously the extra midfielder in there which brings in Giovanni Lo Celso or Dele Alli to play behind the two strikers and i think that that is something that Nuno will look to uh, exploit because both Lo Celso and Dele are extremely creative players they're very good on the ball and they will provide an extra creative threat so op- depends on the opposition depends on how Nuno would want to approach certain games but uh that was my these two lineups were that was uh, uh, how i see uh, them lining up okay ask oh, so just a quick question um and this sorry again it might be a stupid question but when would you play 343 as opposed to 352 like you said there what determines which formation that you want to play is it more what the way the opposition plays or is it more the way you want to play in a certain match how, what makes that decision for you it's a bit of both so just uh in terms of if i was just to look at it in terms of how the opposition are playing if you've got a team against you who like to play centrally who try to create central progression yep uh play with possession and i mean not necessarily possession i'd say but basically like to try and exploit the center yep that's when you try that's when you probably use a 352 because immediately you've got the two strikers there who can when you don't have the ball when the opposition have possession the two strikers can stay central block off passing lanes yep um into midfielders force the ball out wide whereas if you're playing a team that's really good down the flanks yep you might probably you'd prob you'd probably move to uh, a 343 like this one because that when the front three drops off you'd see the wingers coming into uh coming into the midfield line and the wing backs dropping into the defensive line so yeah. the 343 will become a 541 in defense and again this is going back to something i spoke about on the last episode where i said that formations are not static in in football you know a team usually will play in one formation or one shape when they have the ball but it will change when they don't have the ball so this is just one perfect example of that where you can see this setup as a 343 but when spurs won't have the ball in the setup they will move into like a 541 with the wing backs dropping back and the wingers dropping back so you you're then covering the width of the pitch and denying the opposition easy ways to you know move the ball down the flanks sure, so so sure. as you said as you said Ray, uh it it depends on the players you have available it depends on what you're trying excuse me it depends on what you're trying to do in the match but if you're looking at it in terms of how the opposition play this is just one simple way of looking at it like uh, in terms of if they play wide or if they like to play uh, with width you probably go with the 343 if they like to play centrally 
you'd probably go with the three uh, three five two. And the thing is, if you've got uh, you know the three five two, and then they play centrally, and then the other team they have got a fluid formation, they change their formation, they start playing around the back uh, or on the side, then you might move to a three four three again. You know, you have to be as you yeah. said, you've got to be fluid in your formations. Yeah, and and both formations are quite interchangeable, especially depending on players. Like if you've got a player who can play multiple roles, yep, you can switch between these two formations, or you can switch between multiple formations. Like yep. again. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the Euros at the, uh, that are obviously going on. We have the we have the final tonight. Uh, Denmark they yeah. they started the tournament with a four two three one, and then unfortunately, obviously, we had the incident with Christian Eriksen. So they then moved to uh, a three four three. But again, in the game against Wales, they really struggled with uh, Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey. You know, picking up space behind the midfield yeah. because they were getting overloaded there. So the the Denmark manager, I think it was. 15 or 20 minutes into the game he moved Andreas Christensen from the three man backline into midfield and they went from a 3-4-3 to a 4-3-3 and that was a change that was made within the game you yep. know 20 minutes into the game so that's just one example of how teams can change stuff and that had a bit that had a bit of, that had a big effect didn't it because you know they started coming more into the game and they won 4-0 yeah exactly exactly so that that tells you how both that how teams can change things around you know uh, during a game without needing to make substitutions for example so sure. and also as you said you know that can then have a huge impact so that's that's the sort of thing you we can expect from nuno and um i'm just going to go into a little more detail sure, around sure, you know, his history yep at at different clubs and then i'm going to look at uh, how there are just certain specific things tactically that you can expect so okay. I mean, uh, if you look at if you look at his history in terms of just uh the numbers now i've got data here from the 2015-16 season which was his second season at valencia unfortunately there's no data available at, for the 2014-15 season which was his first season at valencia so yep. this is basically um a look at some just top top line numbers from the last six seasons that that nuno has uh, spent as a manager so if you look at ppda for example and i explained ppda in the last uh, the last time we spoke pray which is it, it is a way to explain or or to show how intensely a team are pressing yeah. and uh, the lower the number the better it is because it 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 basically reflects the number it's passes per defensive uh, action so it tells you how often a team are making a defensive action like a block a tackle an interception for x number of opposition passes so in the list over here you can see that in the 2016-17 season when he was at porto uh porto had a ppd of 5.77 that means that for every nearly every six passes that the opposition made um porto were attempting a defensive uh, uh a defensive uh, action whether that's a tackle a block an interception or whatever it may be and it's also important to remember that ppda is normally measured in the top 60% of the pitch so from the opposition from the goal line on the opposition's goal till about where the center circle ends in your own half so yep. you're essentially looking at how high a team is pressing or high or how you know uh, along with how intensely they're pressing so sure if we look at this table um other than other than porto Was he manager at Porto Wolves, or do you mean Valencia? And both at Wolves and Valencia. Sorry, yeah. No, no, I'm saying like other, other than Porto, where Porto were a very high pressing team, sure. they pressed quite aggressively. Yeah. The rest of his sides have not been extremely aggressive. Like you okay. can see, last season Wolves had the second highest PPDA. That's why 19th. When I say 19th, I mean that they had the second highest PPDA in the league in the Premier League. The year before that it was 17th. The year before that it was 18th. So they've consistently been in the bottom 3 in terms of intensity of press or just how hard they press you know right. they've been one of the sides that look to sit back sit and back, that's yeah. true even in the 17 18 season in yep. the 17 18 season when wolves were in the championship which they won by a big margin they were still 21st out of 24 teams in terms of uh how high they press or how you know how hard they press so i think that's something that we can expect again from from uh from him he does put a lot of emphasis on physical training and on fitness so i do expect that side 
to improve for Spurs because I think that was also a concern under Mourinho. But with that, I don't think it'll be a very aggressive uh, press or a very aggressive side. I think it ties back to what system he's going to play. If he's going to play with the back three and the, if he's going to try and implement similar s- strategies to how he was doing at Wolves, it'll, it will be uh, a less intense style of play. But if he looks to go how he did with Porto, then we could potentially see more attacking football. But it must be noted here that Porto have been, you know, and still are one of the heavyweights of Portuguese football. It's the, the Portuguese title has over the last 20 years been sort of been handed back and forth between Benfica and Porto. You know, yep. Sporting, yep. Sporting Portugal just won the title last season, but that was their first title in 19 years. Yep. So Porto have been one of the strongest sides in Portugal here. And that's not the case with Wolves or Spurs. So yeah, with regard to their standing in England. So I, I I am inclined to think that it will be a case of uh, Nuno playing a little more uh, conservative. I wouldn't say conservatively, but him maybe playing a little not as intensely or not as uh, much on the front foot as as he did at Porto. And again, if you look at the next one, which is possession, again Porto is the is the is the outlier there where you see an average of almost sixty one percent possession for the season. Everywhere else, it's been around the fifty percent mark. Wolves, it's been 45%, 48%. So, you, we, we, I, I know we had a question um, on the last week around what we can expect in terms of possession numbers. I, I Again, I think that just in terms of possession, I don't think Wolves are going to dominate possession. Uh, sorry, Spurs are going to dominate possession. Yep. They will probably look to you know try and sit back and counter-attack, which I think is fine. I think Spurs, again, have the players to be able to do that. And I move on to the sort of tactical elements of that in a bit. But Again, um, lastly, if you look at the XG and the XGA, uh, they Wolves were sort of, I'd say, around the mid-table in terms of the quality of chances they created with respect to the rest of the league. So they ranked 13th, 8th, 10th in the league for XG over the last three seasons. They were fourth in the 17-18 season, but that was in the championship. So that's obviously um, quite a reduction in quality. Porto is again the outlier here where they were you know, top of the league for XG, top almost top of the league for goals scored. It's a similar story when you look at XGA. Uh, they've been more or less around mid-table, although the 1920 and 1819 seasons were quite good. They were fifth. They were the fifth and fourth best sides in the league in terms of XGA, and the fifth and sixth best sides in the league league in terms of uh, goals conceded. I think last season, 2020-21 at Wolves can be thought of as an outlier because there were just so many mitigating circumstances, you know. Um, I, I spoke about how you know, Nuno is someone who is a family man in that sense. He likes to create that family environment. He himself has spoken about how he suffered from not being able to visit Portugal over the last, say, year or so to yep. meet his family. And yep. Being away from his own family took a toll on his own mental health and his own um, mood and all of that. Sure, sure. Uh, there was obviously there was obviously the injury to Raul Jimenez. Yep. The the mid season switch to a back four which they weren't used to. So I think when you look at all of that, the 2020-21 season was a bit of an outlier from Wolves. I think you can expect to see um, Spurs. I, I think they will improve defensively under under Wolves uh, under Mur- uh, under Nuno, rather uh, in terms of what we saw under Mourinho. You know, Mourinho has always been thought of as a very good manager in terms of. Uh, setting up different teams to defend, but that really wasn't the case uh, over the last season at, at Spurs. But I think Nuno will be able to recapture that. And while uh, the attacking side of things may take a little bit more time to to come through, defensively, I think Spurs will be on the money. One of the uh, things we had, they, Harshal... They will, I don't think they're going to concede too many. One of the things Tottenham were famous for go last season... One of the things Tottenham were famous for last season was conceding goals in the last five, ten minutes of matches. They lost about, I don't know how many points from winning positions. You know, Do you think that's going to change under Nuno? Do you think we're going to be more secure for the whole yeah. of the game? I do think so because, again, that that is something that stemmed from Mourinho's mentality. He, very famously, if Spurs take a, or, you know, were taking a lead... He then sit back and defend. He wouldn't try and score another goal. Yeah. If it's one nil, he wouldn't try and make it two nil. And that 
came back to bite Spurs quite a lot, where they drew games and they lost games because they hadn't scored it enough early on and they invited pressure on them. I don't think that'll be the case under Nuno. I mean, okay, I'm not good. saying that there will be times when you need to sit back sure, defend sure. when the opposition are doing well, when they have momentum. But in terms of mentality, I don't think that, that that'll happen. You know, um, it's okay. not a case of, you know what, we've got one goal, that's fine. He, he you will pro- you will see and i just think in general wolves have shown a lot of mental resilience over the last three or four seasons and that's a lot of that is down to um a lot of that is down to nuno and the coaching staff so that i expect that to be transplanted uh, in at spurs as well good excellent so uh, yeah. you now, go ahead um, Hush, you got just, another chart you wanted to show yeah this is just as the title suggests it's a 10 game average of um the xg and xga for nuno under the last six seasons this seasons we spoke about so valencia porto and then wolves this is a pretty useful way to look at long term trends and see you know how well a manager did or how badly they did in terms excuse me in terms of creating chances and conceding chances and again we're looking at a 10 game rolling average to to remove um, you know outliers there could be one game where a team you know created 4.5 worth of xg but if i was to just plot those on the chart then you'd see wild swings because single as i said you know xg when you're looking at long term um, trends and long term uh, implications it's it's best to look at xg in this manner rather than single observation so we can see here that the season at porto again stands out where there's a huge difference in the in the xg and the xga there's a huge difference in terms of the number of chances created or rather the quality of chances created and the quality of chances conceded everywhere else it's they're, they're a lot closer i think again you can see in the 17 18 season in the championship wolves did really well and that's reflected here by the fact that the xg and the xga the xg is higher than the xga for for most for the entire season the seasons after that it, it overlaps there are times where the expected goals against has gone above the expected goals which basically means that you'd probably expect to concede more goals than you were scoring which yep. is obviously not a good thing so yep. and the last season as you can see the last season was not really good 2020 2021 but as i've already mentioned how i think that that is a bit of an outlier and in general you can expect to see that you know the xga will be lower than the xg long term say 10 15 20 30 odd games and in terms of goal scoring it will be down to um the players that that nuno has at his disposal because in that sense he is a little bit similar to mourinho in that he might he uh, as i said you know he, there will be a bit of emphasis on counter attacking but it will be a lot more structured than than we've seen under mourinho so overall I I think it's it's a good uh time to get him because he will you know he he he'll, he'll I think he needed to get away from Wolves the environment he he spent four seasons there and at times you need a bit of a change and I think Spurs can give that give him that change with a fresh squad that is you know that will be receptive to his ideas there's all you know because there's also a case of you know the same guy repeating the same message over and over again so two three four seasons it loses value yep yep that's what happened with pochettino i think he lost its value exactly yeah exactly and i think that spurs need a fresh voice and he will be able to provide that and as as i've shown with these numbers and and some of the metrics that have uh, that we've seen here he will i think immediately improve the defense the attack could take a little bit more time but because it's but if uh, spurs play with a sort of back five counter attacking football i think that plays into the hands of the of the squad that spurs have because i think that's it's very well suited to playing in that manner and i'm just going to now um, look at a few tactical setups that you can expect to see from spurs uh, there's a lot of noise in the background harshal is coming through uh, apologies i think that's just start of my window i'm going to give me a second i'm just going to close it yeah sorry yeah yeah i hope that's better now yeah a lot better thanks uh, very much thank yeah, you yeah as i was saying uh no 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 worries right Uh, as i was saying i'm just going to look at a few tactical setups now that you can expect to see from spurs both in and out of possession in the two uh formations the 343 the 352 so 
let's look at this one for example now obviously spurs are in white the opposition are in blue here uh this is say an example where the opposition have the ball and spurs are in a 352 now if you can see the in this example I put, the ball is with the the right sided center back in the in the opposition defense this what i'm trying to do here is show you how the defense will usually set up or rather the team will set up yep. when they when they're defending so if you can see on the flanks there's automatically a two versus one um, numerical overload that's created because if you're playing against a team that's playing with a back four i've i've set them up in a 433 here but it could be a 4231 or any other sort of configuration here but any team that plays with the back four and wingers automatically when you're playing with the back when you are playing with the back five out of possession your wing back and the wide center back will be able to form uh, uh an overload on the opposition winger you can see i've highlighted those areas there so yeah. it will be difficult for them to sort of receive possession turn and and you know run into space the only way they can do do that is by pushing their full backs forward so as you can see in this image the full backs are quite deep for the opposition they'll need to push on the full backs to then try and have a two versus two situation but then obviously that leaves the threat of a counter attack so that automatically naturally the way the formation works gives you an overload in in the wide spaces it also gives you excuse me it also gives you an overload potentially in central midfield because again when you're playing with against a team that are playing with a 4-3-3 the 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 man at the base of the opposition midfield the number 6 uh, so will be a lot deeper obviously than the than the other two midfielders as you can see here they you know the the three spurs midfielders will be able to again have a 3 versus 2 um numerical advantage in that zone of the pitch while the two strikers the two spurs strikers will look to stay central and block passes into that number 6 so you can see like you know the the center backs here will not be easily uh, able to pass to that number 6 because your two strikers are blocking the passing angles they're marking him they're not allowing him to get space so let's look at chelsea for example i i know chelsea have been playing with a back 5 with a back 3 but say if they're playing with a 4-3-3 uh, and it's jorginho who's at the base of midfield yep uh, a lot of chelsea's play flow through, flows through uh, Jorginho but you can shut that down by doing this where the two strikers are marking not I wouldn't say marking him but basically marking the space and marking the passing channel so it's very difficult for him to get onto the ball the only thing spurs oh sorry the opposition which say it's chelsea in this example the only thing uh, the opposition can do easily here is to play the ball out wide to the full backs as you can see the full backs are um you know they're, they're they're free and this is something that wolves did really well under nuno and pass the ball out to the full backs because the moment the ball is passed out to the full back and this is the next image over here you can see um the team which in this case is spurs move out wide to try and shut down options then with the ball back the back five will shift so that the the right in this example your right wing back will move tight to the winger you still have a back four so you still have a four versus two against the uh, against the two opposition attackers the 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 winger and the striker and your wide uh, the 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 striker who's wide on the side where the ball has gone so in this example your right uh, sided striker will go out to the flank he'll sort of block the pass in field into the midfielder through his body positioning and uh, your other striker will just sort of sit on the other midfielder or he and he can also sort of sprint out to the center back if um you know the left the left back in this example tries to play the uh, pass back so again you can see here how it's not um you know easy for the for the for the man on the ball to find passes to his teammates without you know there there will be risky passes because there will be a, an opposition player very close by looking to make a tackle and get the ball back sure and sure this this sort of wide so if you can see in this image the next one there's a sort of triangle that have created there and that sort of wide triangle is something that we saw a lot under under wool uh, under nuno at bulls and we can expect to see at spurs as well because it's again it's a continuation of the previous example where the left back the opposition left back has the ball 
your defensive line has now essentially become a back four because the players have basically come in. So the left wing back has come in field to become a left back. They've all sort of tucked in, as you can see uh, with the arrows. The And the right wing back has moved forward to sort of attack the guy on the ball, the left back here. And uh, your, your striker is sort of dropping away to close off the pass to the centre back. One of the midfielders is staying central to close off the pass inside. And you also have, you know, both of those midfielders being marked by your midfielders. Your striker is marking the opposition uh, number six. So this, I mean, this image makes it very clear. The where, where can the left back go? The, all he can hope to do is try and play a long pass infield to, to his striker, which, you know, it's difficult to play those accurately. And it's quite easy for, for defense and just to get in, get, win the header and win the ball back. Or he can try and play it back, which will be a difficult one to do and a risky one because you can lose possession in, in a dangerous area. So this sort of, this is basically an example of like a, of a wide pressing trap where initially you're forcing the opposition wide, you're staying compact centrally, you're forcing the opposition to go out wide. And once they've done that, you sort of spring your press, you spring your trap in that sense to try and win the ball back. And that's, this is something that Bulls did really well under Nuno and I expect to see this um, sort of this sort of movement or this sort of uh, situation happen when when Spurs play next season as well. Now, moving on to this was with um, Spurs playing in a three-five-two. Now, say Spurs play in a three-four-three. Three. I mentioned earlier how when that happens, when the opposition have the ball, it'll become a five-four-one, and you can see this sort of shape in this image here. It's quite clear there's a 5-4-1 shape that your that your uh, team is setting up in because it's it's and and you're covering the width of the pitch where you it won't be easy for the opposition to play down the wings because you have a winger and a wing back on the flanks to you know uh, press to to block passing lanes as uh, and make it difficult for you to progress you'll have to come inside and uh, as i said that it's that's the that's one of the ways in which you can differentiate between when a 3-4-3 and a 3-5-2 is used based on how the opposition play. So this sort of setup is what you can expect to see from Spurs when they play in a 3-4-3. It will become a 5-4-1 out of possession. And in terms of attack, now when Spurs do have the ball in this 3-4-3 shape, because again, you have a winger and a wing back, it's easy to attack down the flanks. One sort of movement that is a quite common again under Nuno and Wolves can I carry on Ray? yeah sorry carry on yeah sorry yeah yeah no worries yeah so uh one one movement that uh, was again quite common uh, under, uh, under Nuno at Wolves was this sort of I'd say wide rotation where you can see the winger on the left, dropping off when the left wing back has the ball. So he'll come short to try and receive possession, player one, two. And because he's coming short, the opposition defender obviously has to follow him. So he's then creating the space for the left wing back to run into. So it sounds very simple, but this was extremely effective for, for Wolves um, over the last three or four seasons, where one of the attackers drops off, plays a quick uh, one two with uh, with the wing back, and because the attack has dropped off, the defender has to follow him, and he's created space in behind for the wing back to run into, and then the wing back can sort of attack the box, cross, uh, you know, play a cut back to to someone running into the box, and again, given the profile of players that Spurs have, I think this this sort of ta tactic can work really well. And lastly, another thing that that Wolves did well, this is if they're playing in a three, if uh, sorry, Spurs are playing in a three five two. The two strikers will stay high and central. So even though one of them could look to drop off like Harry Kane does quite often, but if it's say a Kane and Son, you can expect to see Kane and Son staying high. And that will force the opposition backline to also then stay deep. Because if you've got two guys who are not dropping off, they're both staying on the shoulder of the defensive line. The defensive line then can't move up because you're leaving space behind. So the defensive line will drop off and that creates space between the defence and the midfield. 
when you're playing and then when you've got the three your three midfielders in the 352 you've got three central midfielders another thing that you can expect to see is one of the central midfielders dropping into the defense what that will do is again the opposition here is you know they have two choices either one of the opposition midfielders has to follow that player or he stays back because if he follows and but obviously there are there are consequences of that so now if he follows the player there's space left behind him if he doesn't follow the player that the player who's dropping off has space and time to receive possession and dictate play so in the event that you know the the defensive midfielder say hoybier drops in and the opposition midfielder follows him you've got space then there as you can see the left sided central midfielder or the right sided central midfielder can then drive into that space with the ball and this is i think particularly relevant because if you've got tangui and dombele in that left sided central midfield spot this could be could work out really well because he's extremely good on the ball in terms of driving up field dribbling he reminds me a lot of musa dembele yeah, when he yeah. was at spurs yeah. he's he's quite yeah so he's quite difficult to um, get you know dispossess in that sense uh, when he's running on the ball so if spurs are able to create this sort of space for him to run into on the ball um it will be i think that will be the best utilization of his talent and that's why i think he will potentially be used when they're playing a 352 so okay. that so when they're playing in a three man midfield when it's a two man midfield he I, i don't know if he'll play that often in the pivot in the two man midfield because his tendency to move forward can leave the defense a little bit uh, unprotected sure, sure, he could sure. play as one of the two one of the three attackers yep so basically uh, in the attacking line but uh, i think when it's a three man midfield is when you can expect to see ndombele play a lot more if it's a two man midfield maybe not but this is basically one example uh, of how spurs can utilize ndombele's strengths within the system that nuno has expected to use yep. and given the amount of money that's been spent on him given just how good he is in my opinion he's a very very good player yep. so mourinho obviously didn't get the best out of him but nuno potentially can in this sort of setup so that's basically what i wanted to talk about in terms of you know the 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 type of tactics the type of formations the type of individual sort of strategies or, or setups that we can expect to see um from nuno at spurs that's excellent hostel that's really really good really detailed analysis really explaining what's going to happen i think our subscribers would really like that i think that's excellent so you know if you've got any comments or any questions for harshal please put them in the comment section remember to comment like and subscribe harshal um i think we've got some good times to look forward for nuno if he can get the right people i think one thing i wanted to ask you is how important is it i mean this is again he has to have the right type of player in each of those positions to execute that strategy if you don't have the right player then it doesn't matter what formation you play it just doesn't work is that right absolutely um you you uh, nailed it in terms of uh because as you said you know the formation is irrelevant if you don't have the right players and that's why the move for uh, takahiro tomi also makes sense because yeah. if you're going to play with a back three yeah. it makes sense to have a player who's comfortable playing in a back yeah. three but can also play out wide you know at wing back or right back if needed yeah. that's also another thing which uh, from the euros for example which i think can have an impact on spurs is again denmark because hoybjerg he he played a very defensive role for spurs he was sitting in front of the defense protecting the defense and he did a good job at that but for denmark especially after they moved to the 343 he was playing in two, in a two man pivot and he was much more creative and much more attacking he was one he was actually the sort of creative heartbeat of denmark he helped set up he, he was creating a lot of chances he was progressive with his passing and again I, i can see that working at spurs as well if they play with the back three because he has the additional protection of another defender behind yep. him he has yep. the protection of wing backs so that's again something that uh, you can expect to see from hoybjerg at spurs if they play with a 343 you know so that that's another example of the rule so of the role suiting him okay. harry kane i think will work brilliantly whichever system if he stays you know, <laughs> wants to play in of course but <laughs> I, i i don't think he's going to leave i think it's going to be very difficult to to get him out of there but uh, of course assuming he stays he'll obviously play a huge role but he works really well again in the system son works extremely well in this system uh 
Lo Celso, Ndombele, Dele, they all can play very good roles in specific, you know, parts of of the way Nuno wants to play. So, yep. as I said, I think I think the Spurs squad is actually quite well set up to play in the way that Nuno wants. So, in that sense, it's it's actually not too bad an appointment. Okay, excellent. Well, listen, Harshal, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Everybody, welcome. Um, Please leave your comments, like, subscribe. I know Harshal's a really popular presenter. We got really good feedback on the last video, Harshal. So thank you very much. We hope to have you again for in the near future on a new podcast. Everybody, put your comments down on what you want, Harshal. Harshal's got a lot of expertise, a lot of experience. Please tell us what you would like to hear from him. Please put that in the comment section. We're trying to arrange that with Harshal. But this is Ray from Spurs ninety five hundred one saying thank you very much. We'll see you on the Nord Pass new podcast, Harshal. Did you want to say goodbye? Yep. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for having me, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting on sometime soon and, and delving a little more into into Spurs. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Arshul. Excellent. You've been listening to the Spurs ninety five oh one podcast. Stay in touch, continue the debate, and let us know what you want to discuss by finding us on YouTube. Tune in after the next match day for more insight. Thanks for listening.